So the companies that don't embrace AI tools, the ones that have decided to avoid it, the ones that, you know, whatever, they're the losers at the end of the day because they're not taking advantage of something that makes their jobs, makes what they're doing more effective and efficient because they really, again, should be getting to curation, not creation. So how do I use this tool to help me get further along in creation quicker so that I can curate the right ideas, get them put together and then get them out there? So um, I think we're in a correction. Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang, we're going to have a good discussion today about some of the things I think everybody's struggling with, and that is with all of the options and opportunities and (laughs) continued change uh, that exists is trying to find our path and way. Um, And to help us in that discussion is going to be Eric Holtzclaw. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that people can chase in regards to, you know, modern marketing. Um, I many, many years ago, I was introduced to um, the concept of an ecosystem and goodness knows the ecosystem in, in marketing has, has changed dramatically. And so we really want to talk about modern marketing transformation, uh, yep. especially in the B2B space. The reality is that the shifts and changes are are so far behind. There's a lot of you know, post COVID things that we shouldn't be doing anymore. And so we're going to get in a really great discussion. But before we do that, if you could share with the B2B DM gang a little bit about your background and expertise, I think that'd be great. So yeah, so I am a recovering technologist. So I spent my early part of my career running development shops. So I was more on like the geek side of the house uh, and then worked briefly for professional building some professional services organizations for some Silicon Valley based companies and owned a research company for a period of time and then sold that business back in 2012 and promised I'd never start another business. And so I accidentally started uh, Liger in 2018. So we are primarily a B2B marketing firm. And the reason that my background works really well in marketing is that I was a technologist and then I did user research. So I understand how technology and users go together. And marketing is so much about using technology nowadays to get to the right user community. So um, it, it puts me kind of in this unique position to talk not only to the marketers about messaging and what's going to work and what's not, but also with the technologists about how we're going to actually implement this thing when uh, when the rubber hits the road. Well, and, and just like you said, ultimately, the, the foundational uh, component and element is that whole buyer behavior. Um, you've written a book on on consumer behavior. Um, all of the all of that data is what we really must pay attention to and adhere to, because oftentimes I see people getting off track where they where they start, you know, talking about things that they would like and would yeah. like. And and it's like, no, 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 we, we need to take you out of the equation because it's not about you. <laughs> yeah, that was always my favorite thing about the research company is we would walk into a room at the beginning of a project and we would have the customer in the you know, conference room talking through what they thought the problem was and telling us all about, you know, oh, this is what it is, yada, yada, yada. And then I was like, well, what's great is we're going to walk out of this room and we're going to go actually talk to the people who are intended to use this product and find out whether or not they agree with you. And 80% of the time, 90% of the time, they didn't. It was completely different. They were looking at, uh, you know, a symptom, not the disease. So what was, what do we need to solve for, right? The, the So how do we get down to that which then drives like ecosystem choice. Where are you going to have your brand show up? Who are you going after? Because each one of them has their own slice and you have to be very specific and selective about what you're doing. No, very much so. Okay, so there's a lot of traps associated with modern marketing transformation. Uh, But I think it probably would be best because I think the perspective on the definition of modern marketing is different uh, in a lot of, from a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. So if you could kind of give us an understanding of what is modern marketing. So what modern marketing is, is 
is it's, it's an interesting space because it feels a lot like financial advisement because things are kind of changing on a pretty consistent basis. And I talk about this and there's some watershed times and periods that happened. And so 2008 is a huge watershed year for marketing. Prior to 2008, we had a lot of control over the customer journey, even with the internet and digital properties. You know, it was very important that you landed on the homepage and you knew what the next action was. And we see a lot of concentration in that. Uh, what happened in 2008 is we got smartphones, ubiquitous internet, and social media all at the same time, hidden underneath this like economic disaster that was occurring. And so people start to blame the economic disaster, but really it was this like incredibly disruptive technology that came onto the scene that disrupted and changed the way that marketing worked over time. So what ended up happening is instead of being able to control the customer and their customer journey, now customers were experiencing their journey in lots of different places. And the longer that's happened, the more customers are smart about knowing that if they come to your digital property, you're going to start serving them ads. Like they avoid all of the things that you're building. So you have to build everything everything, everywhere else because they're only spending maybe 20 to 25% of their customer buyer journey, specifically in B2B, on any digital property that is one you own. And so as we move forward, people become more um, advanced. You know, As consumers, they start to translate what they do in the consumer market into the B2B market. Like, hey, I'm used to this thing happening over here. Why isn't it happening over there? And then you mentioned COVID. What I like about COVID or like is that it changed behaviors again. So anything that happens over 40 to 45 days of a period of time, like I haven't walked into a grocery store for any significant amount of time since COVID. I use Instacart all the time. So if you want to get in front of me with a new product or service that would typically be on like the end of a end cap in the grocery store, you got to figure out a different way to get to me. So knowing what's in and what's out now Marketing used to be like you could go to school, you'd learned how it worked. It was like almost like accounting and it's not. It's so much more like stock trading. Like what's the stock of the moment? What are the bond components? How do I know what the mix should be for my company such that I'm going to be effective over time? And it is an over time play. It is not a transactional play. Marketing used to be transactional. Sales was a relationship. Marketing is now a relationship and sales is transactional. So that switch that happened we as marketers own way more of the customer buyer journey and building that trust and getting them to make the, to make them buy, not selling to them, getting them to buy. Wow. Um, there's a lot to unpack in what you just talked, what you were just talking about there. I, I mean, these, these major shifts and, and one other thing that is, is also shifted as well is a lot of the decision makers within organizations are no longer in the workforce. I mean, a, yeah, a lot of people don't realize is that, a lot of those people have left. So you have essentially a, a, a new uh, situation of, you know, people who haven't been in, you know, that type of role um, having to now make decisions for the organization. And that has an impact as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, and go ahead. Well, one build on it too is we talk about B2B versus B2C and it's really relational versus transactional. And it's also about risk. So, if in the B2B world, the risk of a bad decision is much higher, like I could lose my job, I could look like an idiot in front of my boss, I'll never get promoted again, like all those things. So there's so much risk in B2B or relational decisions. That could also be true if you're making a decision to do something that's against the grain. So like we work with a company that has a, a different way of uh, approaching a medical procedure than most people know in another common way. So to make the decision for that medical procedure, like you're taking your health in your, in your hands, right? So relational, high risk, whatever, those decisions, like there's so much um, knowledge that people want to capture before they do make that decision. Transactional, like if I buy a a Christmas gift off of Instagram I didn't like because of a promotion, like who cares? You know, there's no, no big deal there, right? Uh, but when we think about B2B and relational, huge risk involved. Uh, so that leads us into some of the new realities of the B2B buyer behavior um, and those shifts when they occurred and the exodus of many people. Um, uh, all, all of those things have changed that B2B buyer behavior. So what are some of the new realities that we must pay attention to so that it's part of our you know, new modern marketing transformation? So what's funny is everything is 
old is still new and everything that's new is still old. So there's some key things that you still have to worry about. So I talk about these in kind of key circles. So we do still need to have a really good digital property of some sort that we're going to drive our, our kind of primary place for driving people. So that needs to be in place. And so you can't ignore it. It needs to, instead of being a catalog, like this is what we do. Most people know what you do. It should be more of a magazine. Like, how do you do it? What, you know, tell the stories of the company, those types of things. So building that into your website and then creating educational content around that website that you can continue to add to over time because Google and AI and other tools are looking for what's the next a new thing that I should be telling someone to educate them on a topic. The little secret is Google doesn't really want to drive anybody to your site that talks about what you do. They want to drive people to answer questions that they're asking. And your site needs to be one of those sites that answers that question and that content then, then will bring them into understanding you as a company. Your outer ring then becomes social media or SEO. And the difference is SEO, do I search for this? Do I know what it is? So I'm going to actively look for it and keywords make sense, those types of things. Social may be more leaned into interruption. So this is a new thing. I've never heard of it. Like you got to get in front of me. So social is going to be a great place to, to kind of make that happen. So those three rings are your standard rings and those are all owned digital properties. And if you remember what I said earlier is the consumer is really, or the buyer is really smart nowadays and they avoid your digital property. But if you don't have those things in place, you miss the last 10% of the kind of buyer journey, which is by far the most important because you've taken so long to get them there. So immediately when you have those things working, you want to start working with like placed content, getting content in other places that, you know, people are reviews, looking for advice or information that's then driving them into your digital ecosystem or into your content. So build those big three and then start to figure out how to create the spider web that's going to pull people in across, you know, places that they may exist, which may be online and they may be in person. And you have to know the buyer to know, you know, where do they tend to spend most of their time to make some of these key decisions. When it, when you start talking about key decisions, uh, I mean, we, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, talking about research, you know, the stats are, are very clear and the research is very clear is that, a very significant degree of the decision-making process for, uh, you know, people who have those responsibilities and worries of, Hey, I'm, I'm going to look foolish. I'm going to lose my job. I mean, all those types of things is that they look to peers, you know, they look to people who are doing and having the same responsibilities and they want to ask them, you know, the, the questions of, Hey, what did you use? What have you tried? Uh, and, and so I would dare to say that that also, has a huge impact on, you know, the modern day, you know, B2B, uh, you know, behavior process. Yeah, it does. The So in the research world, when I was in the research company, we came up with a set of personas for businesses and business owners, and they fall in four categories. And so category one is the early adopter. They're the person who's going to download something and try it out. They're okay with bugs. They like to be part of early, right? They'll be the first to try like a, a product like Slack. So like they were using Slack before anybody else. They they will put something in place and they they you you have to be careful with them because they really do want to be part of kind of that in crowd. In the B2C world, they're the people who found shows like Lost before any of us. And then they told us about it. Like this is a great show. You should watch it. And then you have a category two, which is very heavily what you discussed, which are fast followers. So they're people who were working um, on their business, not in it. They're looking for a partner. Uh, they want to they go to networking events. COVID was really a big deal for them because they weren't able to get out and kind of interact with people and they're asking advice and those types of things. And so there's a really rich, good group to go after. But then category three are people who are working in their business and they look for a vendor. So they want something off the shelf, uh, something that's predictable. Uh, they don't have a lot of time. They're typically kind of too wrapped up, you know, uh, and they don't make a change until they have to. And so we have businesses who are going after threes as their primary and maybe sometimes twos. And then our final group is four. And group four are government agencies, people who do RFPs, maybe a franchise um, where you don't have a lot of control, like the franchise tells you what you can and can't do. And so knowing which one of those is what, is going to drive a little bit about how you're going to even message. So if I'm messaging to category two, we've got a product we're helping a company release in the next few months. Category two, do this because it's right. Category three, do this because you're going to get in trouble. 
And so like those are two very different, uh, small nuance changes, but two cares about doing it because it's right. Two, three wants to avoid the pain of not doing it because they may get fined and things like that in that category. Well, as you're talking, I start thinking about some of the discussions that I hear uh, pe people referring to in regards to increasing revenue. And they talk about partnering and increasing their partnering and partner success and and all of that. And I start thinking about those, those rings that you mentioned. You know, where, where do partner channels and all that fit in? Because that's becoming a, a very, you know, competitive space as well. Yeah. They they would primarily fit in category two. So one might have some of those, but category two thinks in the, they think about they're forward thinking. They're like, how do I progress? How they don't want to do anything brand new, but they're willing to do something that's like going to help expand and extend their business because they put themselves in a place to do that. Category three doesn't often have time for that. So they're just trying to solve a problem, right? They're continuing to like patch the <laughs> patch the holes in the business. And so your category two, and it makes it sound like category two is better than category three. It's really not true. When category three finds something, they stick with it forever because it, you know they put it in place and they, they're going to run that thing. So you got a subscription model product or whatever you want a category three, because they're never going to replace you. Category two is willing to go through the pain and suffering of changing if they think they can get a better benefit from it. So they're not as, they're not, even though they're partnering, they're like, okay, but if we can find something that's going to make our business work better, make it, you know, um, get to that next level, then we are willing to go through the pain of changing it out. So if I were building partner and alliance models, I'd think more about category two, unless that partner has access to a lot of category threes, and I want to partner with them to get to the category threes. Like that could be a way to stretch across because the sales channels and the way that you talk are very different. So if I already own a bunch of category three customers, and you're a category two business that wants to sell to them, you should really go talk to someone who has a sales team who knows to how to have the fear, uncertainty, and doubt conversations that category three reacts to. Category two is more of a progressive, empowered uh, type of, of a company or organization. Okay. I, okay, so I think talking to a lot of folks that are responsible for like go-to-market strategies and being able to determine, I you know, their ideal customer profiles and, and all of those types of things. I don't think they think in that particular context uh, in regards to the, 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 the different rings and categories and, and they just try to make something happen. What's the goal <laughs> on that? Well, so we, we take clients through what we call brand therapy. So our very first session with a client is what I call brand therapy. So I get them in a room. We talk about macro and micro trends that are impacting their business. Who's their ideal client that they're going after? And they can only pick one. You can't pick multiple because that's just too many. You know, you got to have one and then maybe a secondary. Uh, we talk about competitors, like how do you fit within the competitor landscape? And, you know, what are they doing and how can we find where you fit? And what we're working with them, we do this kind of card sort exercise that gets them to pick names and like all this. It's a one, it's a lot of fun. I, I love it. It's my favorite thing we do. And at the end, just like going through therapy, you know something better about yourself, right? Like, well, I do this thing because of this that happened to me or whatever. And so we're looking at that from a brand perspective and getting companies to fully own and understand their brand and where it fits within the ecosystem. That does not mean that you have to like it. Like you can get to the end of that session and go, mm, maybe we need to be aspirational and think about ways of changing it. But to be aspirational means you're probably going to fundamentally have to change some things within the brand, right? Like you'll maybe have to have a different workforce or a different way that you go to market. And I use a B2C example for this because people get it. So I, in my last business, I had a business partner. He was the same age I was. We made the same amount of money. We owned the same amount of the company. Like we were basically demographically the same person. I am a Starbucks guy through and through. I go to Starbucks it's my kind of coffee. I like, you know, they're everything about the experience. He was a Dunkin' Donuts guy. He would go to Dunkin' Donuts and he never went to Starbucks. I never go to Dunkin' Donuts. But demographically, we're the same person. Persona-wise, we're very different. And it's how Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts show up in the world, right? And so your brand shows up in the world in a way, and it's going to attract the buyer based on how you're kind of show your messaging, all those kind of things. And it's very important if you have a smaller marketing budget for you to be super consistent and super targeted on what that is. Bigger companies don't make the mistake, but could afford to do it. Small companies make the mistake all the time where they try to scatter shot and take just a few dollars and spread them too thin. 
Well, I think you hit a couple of key words right there, and that's regards to consistency. And and you know, so how I one of the transformations that needs to change, especially when we start talking about high ticket B two B sales, you know, is the thinking of you know campaign versus consistency. Amen. A hundred percent. Yep. Because people are entering the buyer journey at different points. You know, you have no idea when they might be right. And consistency is my number one. I, I'm asked on podcasts all the time, like, what's the biggest mistake you see marketing organizations make? And I say lack of consistency. Like, and it's because it's old to them, right? Like you've built this campaign, you've done this thing. You're like, oh, well, we just, we've already done that. I'm like, yeah, but not everybody saw that. <laughs> like, you, like we can still reuse it. I mean, the creation of content, we're a big content driven organization and we'll see companies spending 80% of their time creating something new, creating a new campaign and 20% of their time promoting it or getting it out in market. And you need to reverse that. It's 20% in creation and 20% in like all that 80% promotion. Like just because you did something years ago, doesn't mean you can't bring it back and it's not going to work as long as it's evergreen. And we look at content over time. So you launch a piece of content, you're not going to know for several months how well that content's really performing. And people start to like, oh, we put that blog up last month or we put that white paper out. And yeah, but it hasn't had time to like mature itself through all of the things in the ecosystem. And we could dial up some of the keywords and drive some additional traffic to it. So give it a chance. Like, give it a chance. So to me, it's almost like uh, the the viral wish. wish. You know, we want that thing to go viral. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You you really don't. Like, that's like going to the gym one day and like coming out of muscle God because you had a really good workout. That just doesn't happen, right? Like, and I was talking to a client last night about this. We're in the middle of kind of getting there. I'm like, what were you told me you want to run a marathon? Like, that's what you told me. And for order for you to run a marathon, it's kind of like Mr. Miyagi and um, uh, in uh, Karate Kid. I've got you out washing cars and you know painting the fence and all that because if you do what I tell you to do, in the next six months you'll be able to run a marathon. But you can't run one today. So that's exactly where we are. That's what it looks like specifically for the type of work you and I talk about transactionally. I can put up a really great video, run a great promotion, put out something that's brand new that nobody's ever heard of and ring that cash register. But typically it's transactional and that may be the only time I get that. We're looking for long-term, you know, risky decisions that those buyers are making and they have to be nurtured and you have to establish that relationship and that's marketing's job. And you're you're talking earlier, the stat, it's a 70% of the B2B decision make has been made before the person picks up the phone, calls you, reaches out to you. They've already made the decision. The only thing your sales team does is either screw up the deal or close it. That's what they do in that last sort of number of uh, reach outs that you you have with them. Okay. So that brings us to the question of the new realities in demand gen versus lead gen. Yeah. Uh, all you, in several different, you know, areas of our conversation just right here, you were giving us some insight into this transformation and you even talked about marketing having more of a responsibility and what happens in regards to that buyer journey. So what are some of the new realities of demand gen versus lead gen? Well, what I see is realities, but also like leaning into. So what you'll see is that B2B doesn't do as good a job on the lead gen side. They do more on demand. So and think about it like organic versus paid. Like, you know, I have B2B clients we've worked with for years and I finally convinced them to do some paid. I'm like, we're at the outer limits of your organic. Like we should do some lead gen off the things we know are working, Right. And then we'll run into other companies that are leaning too heavily into paying for all of their traffic. And they had like, if they turned it off, they wouldn't have a funnel anymore. And so balancing that, you know, one or the other is not good. You got to do, you know, you, you got to do a little bit on one side or the other. And if you're leaning too heavily, like we find all the time when people are doing lead gen, like that channel could go away. Like you could have a channel that works really well on that side. And if you haven't invested on some demand gen side, then you could lose all of the revenue and traffic that's coming in. On the same side, you could be stunting or likely you're stunting the growth of your organization by just leaning too heavily into demand gen without doing some lead gen to kind of push people over or stay in front of them at a time that maybe you haven't thought about or demand gen won't support. So even when we started talking about some of the shifts in behavior, I would dare to say that that also has a direct impact on lead gen versus demand gen as well, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's, it's about 
again, messaging at the right time. So it's it's 21 touch points to get someone to really drive what we, we look at branding awareness, traffic, conversion, optimization, and maintenance. Batcom. That's what we that's our kind of philosophy. So everyone wants conversion. And Legion is supposed to be getting you to conversion, like really close. But you've got to move back to like what kind of traffic are you getting? How aware are people? What's the brand? Like we got to fix those things. And then when we can get predictable traffic and conversion, we're optimizing and maintaining that. And so that's where you're paying for it. You know what those messages are. You know what it looks like. You can also use paid to help drive what you should be doing organically because it gets you there faster, right? So like if you, so you got to balance it out again. You know, I'm not a financial advisor. Like I pay a guy to manage my portfolio, but what I'm looking for for clients is to tell me what is your marketing budget on a monthly, yearly, whatever basis and you need to rely on experts to help you place those chips and understand that month to month, the chips may need to move. They shouldn't move so much that, because that again is a lack of consistency. So if you're with some agency that wants to change everything 30 days, that's a red flag, <laughs> but you should trust them to determine a channel or whatever. And we we both know, like, I mean, the social media channels right now are in a hot mess. Like, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So like, where should I be placing my bets? Where should I be putting you know, my ad dollars, like those kind of things. All the clients we work with have day jobs and politics they have to deal with internally. They need to leave that to us to figure out where to place and then hold us accountable for moving things up and to the right, like move move it up and to the right and make sure that we're ringing the cash register. Well, and as you were talking about, you know, shifts and changes, and you even starting to talk about content creation and how that content is found. You refer to a lot of organizations are spending 80% of their time actually creating uh, and only 20% promoting and they need to transform that and flip it. Um, But when you overall look at the amount of content that can be created in such a short period of time, and I think also the, the whole quality issues is kind of, I think it's a bit, I think that's a very slippery slope to talk about because I could create the absolute best piece of content. But the fact is that there's so much content out there and more getting generated you know, every single day that, you know, it, it's hard for it to stand out and, and to be seen. And that's yeah. because of AI, you know, I, mean, yeah. I talked to somebody the other day and they said they're, cre- they're creating 10 AI generated blog posts a day for a particular, um, you know, target that they're going after. And and I'm like, this, I see this soon, you know, and we're just at the early stages of this. I see this being a significant issue in regards to modern marketing transformation, I mean, where do you put all of that? So I'm, I I feel really fortunate because I told you I was a recovering technologist and I'm pretty old. So I've seen a lot of things, right? So I've seen internet and all these kind of disruptions that have occurred. And I'm really kind of hot on AI. I think it's an amazingly new, good disruption for us. And that we're so, we're in the very early stages. We're like at the DOS prompt of, or the, the whatever they called it on the, well, I do. I'm around DOS prompts. I did DOS prompts too before there was Windows. So you know we're at that stage of like text based whatever, and people are learning how to use it. So I don't know that we fully understand. And there's some speculation of just like happened with every other technology that's ever come on the you know the world is we're not ready yada yada. Like the professional services organization I worked for, this was like early 2000s. I was going out and meeting with Fortune 500 companies trying to convince them that they should have a, a presence on the internet. Right. Like, I mean, that's well into people having already done it. And so I, I hear a little bit of that. So so I think there's it's going to be interesting because I think also the AI is going to be what helps us to determine what's the right AI. Like it's going to be this kind of thing, you know? So like if somebody is creating 10 blog posts a day, then they'll use AI to be like, yeah, that's ridiculous. Don't go to that site. They're creating too much content. Right. So it'll probably battle itself in some ways to work it out. The big thing about it for AI is it's here. It's not going away. The genie is out of the box it is an amazing research tool. I love working with it to like teach me a new topic that I haven't heard of. And I'm not Googling as much as I used to. Like I will start there and have it bring me stuff. Like I have an example, there was a new product we were working with, with a customer. I knew nothing about it. And when, in within 10 minutes, I knew so much that I could actually build the discovery session I needed to and whatever, where I would have had to spend a lot of time on Google going and searching and looking for things. So trying to land the plane on this, we are in a place of not creation, but curation. 
AI can create it. It needs to be curated. So the stuff that comes across, the companies that are doing it right are allowing the AI to kind of get them 90% of the way there. But the the beauty in it is in the last 10%. It's in the your opinion about it, what you know about it, you know, those kind of things, just like an artist. Like, so that's where that's where we are today with it. Like, I think AI is a great way to build it, but unless you're like adding value to what's being created and an opinion and, you know, pulling out the things that are wrong, like if you don't know that, then it's not, not going to be helpful. And people will smell that. Like they know it's a um, Malcolm Gladwell's blink or tipping point. I don't know which one it is, but he talks about how even the non expert can identify a statue that's a fake. Like that's how I did a focus group this week. And it was an evaluation of AI written versus people written. And you can always detect the AI. It's too perfect. It's too too many like flowery words, things like that. So I see it as a helper. It's here to stay. And some of the stuff that we're seeing, like Google's planning to go like to this Wikipedia, you know, search page. So that answers your question for you. We have to have the right kind of content to show up in that Wikipedia version. So so I'm not as worried about the mass of it because I think that's going to be worked out. Okay, so I think what I hear you saying is that the definition of quality uh, will be changing because of the way that the search, search engine optimization, uh, SEM, you know, search engine management, all, all of that type of strategy is going to shift because of AI because of you know all these other things. So, like you were saying, early stages. Where is this? all going um i think that's why you need to go back and rely on the experts is what i hear oh yeah and it's what's it going to be integrated into what's it going to look like in its second third fourth iteration because we're really in a first iteration of this it's really powerful it's really amazing it's a great research tool there's it's a lot of it's a really good starting point for a lot of things and you know, the pursuit of humans is to, we're not, we weren't really built to like work the way that we do. We were built to pursue things. And so in my opinion, this starts to get rid of stuff that's like, well, why do you want to do that? Like, why do you want to write meta descriptions for your pages? That sounds like a terrible thing. Like let that, let the robot do it and then just double check it and make sure it's right. And then you can go on to how can we evoke human emotion? Because marketing is about evoking human emotion. It's like making you angry, making you sad, you know, making you happy. And humans do that. Computers don't do that. Humans know how to make another human cry. <laughs> so, and that's what marketing is about, visceral reaction. Uh, um, okay. So then I'm sitting here and I'm looking at decisions that need to be made because the problems that need to be solved. And if you think about it from a, organizational perspective, the costs continue to increase in remarketing. Um, the acquisition costs continue to increase. Uh, there, um, I was actually on a, a listening to a call the other day where they were talking even about in the um, mergers and acquisition areas within organizations is that, you know, a lot of these firms, you know, who, who are part of that see where expenses are rising at a rate uh, that it's more than double what revenue increases are. Yeah. And and so when we start thinking about that gap um, and we start talking about this transformation process and doing modern marketing and ad costs going up, all of these different things, I, I can't afford for that gap to continue to rise. My expenses are increasing at a rate that's faster than my revenues. Right? So I'm, I'm thinking about where do I need to start? So where do I need to start if I'm thinking about modern marketing transformation? So, so what I would say is, I, I I see and understand that the AI tools, because actually for with with us, the AI tools have brought my cost down in the past three or four months. I mean, their contractor fees I am not paying any longer. And their hours I had people dedicated to doing that that example I gave you about needing to get up to speed on something and it took me like 10 minutes. I would have assigned it to a researcher in my company and it would have taken them three or four days. They would have had to build a report, get it back to me, yada, yada, yada. And I didn't have to pass that out to anybody. So I do think there's a correction occurring. And so even though things cost seem to be going up, we're probably moving dollars in a different way. 
and acquisition will become more difficult because we're smarter and we're more insular, right? So that seems it seems appropriate, right? But it does mean that just like with automakers and all kinds of things, this just happens to be impacting white collar workers. We have an impact to costs are being removed out of a part of the supply chain where they may be added somewhere else because those places are more effective. So I, I think it'll start to smooth its you know smooth itself out a little bit right? As we start to see that. So the companies that don't embrace AI tools, the ones that have decided to avoid it, the ones that, you know, whatever, they're the losers at the end of the day, because they're not taking advantage of something that makes their jobs, makes what they're doing more effective and efficient, because they really, again, should be getting to curation, not creation. So how do I use this tool to help me get further along in creation quicker so that I can curate the right ideas, get them put together and then get them out there. So um, I think we're in a correction. That's my opinion. Okay. So speaking of the the correction component and thinking about uh, some of the things that you were referring to earlier and using other platforms in order to be able to do that, um, mm-hmm. platforms keep you know popping up all over. You talked about the chaos of existing platforms. Uh, we talked about own properties. Um, you know, I mean, ultimately, again, how do I get started? How do I transform to modern day marketing? I start thinking about all of those different elements and my own properties. And what do I, how do I need to, you know, rethink that concept? You, uh, that's where nothing old, uh, nothing new or everything old is new, whatever. I'm not saying it right, but you still have to have a really nice house, which is your primary digital property. So like if your website is not structured towards your audiences, if it doesn't, you know, tell stories about what you do versus it being a catalog. Like I, we start with the basics. Like, is the website working? Do we have good content being created? Is our social and SEO working? Like you got to have all those things. Those are going to be kind of the driveway to your house, the house, all those structures. And then all the stuff that's around it is the buzz. And you have to decide what right, what's the right buzz to put in place? What are the right tools? The, you know, marketing technology, Category has what some amazing like 10,000 tools. It's like going to Home Depot. You got to pick the right one off the shelf, depending upon what you're doing. And I'm against, there's some companies like, we want one platform that does everything. And I'm like, that's a terrible idea. That like the me renovating my house with the screwdriver, right? Like I'm going to use the screwdriver and renovate my whole house, but it's only good at taking screws out of the wall. So I still go back to the basics. It's just like, a good diet and good exercise. And then you can do the, well, which is your favorite? You like to swim, you like to whatever. Like if we think about marketing, we add that stuff on the outside and it's going to be based on who your customer is, who your company is, but you got to get the basics right. Okay. So then I'm starting to think about transformational shifts and things to measure. Um, Oh yes. That's one of my favorite topics. Yes. Good. So how has that shifted? Stop measuring how many people are going to your stupid homepage. I do not care about your homepage. In fact, I see people coming to your homepage as a failure. So if you are driving people to your homepage, that means you don't have enough thick content to take them based on some problem need that you've, you know, either discussed in social or an ad. I want them to be dropped onto the aisle. So if we go back to my store analogy, putting them on the homepage is like putting them in the front lobby and then they don't know where to go. So, you know, we have clients who've historically have judged how many people are hitting their homepage as the number one metric. And I'm like, it's a failure in my opinion. It's bad, 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 right? So we want to drive people to something that's answering a problem they're trying to solve because they really aren't there for your homepage. Like once they get there, they got to figure out where to go and whatever. So deeper linked into your site and your content as a measurement over a kind of homepage. We also are looking at, you know, initially how many people are we driving to this other content? What are we missing? And the the reports will tell you that, Hey, like people are looking for this stuff and they get to our site. We don't have enough of it. So once we have them at your site, how long are they staying? Are we keeping them engaged? Are they, you know, clicking on other things? What are the sources that are driving them in? Because again, we're talking about 70% of the decisions being made outside of your site. So like, what are you measuring that has nothing to do with your own digital properties that make sure people are following those other paths that you're putting out there? So, you know, it's, there's this very strong e-commerce B2C, like this person takes this action and they end up on my homepage and I click on this next thing and they go to this next thing and then they click buy. And I'm like, 
no. <laughs> so <laughs> what are those attributions and number of times? It's why we built a, our own display ad network and it's a B2B display ad network because B2C is so driven on uh, spillage and, you know, attribution and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's going to happen. Like it's, I got to get these people in front of them for a long time. And it may be six to eight months before they click on the first thing that I've shown them because they're not interested or they don't need that thing until that, that point. You, you bring up an evil word, uh, an attribution. And when yeah. I start thinking about modern day marketing and the transformation process and the metrics and everything else, you know, how do I need to approach attribution today versus how I would approach it in the past? So on the B2C side, attribution works easier because you can be like, hey, we ran this ad and da, 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 and we saw this. On the B2B side, what I see companies doing, and it's very, very hard, is that they're not measuring enough. So they're not tracking like all the things they're doing because all of them together are what bringing, is bringing someone to an ultimate decision to work with your company. So making sure your ecosystem is set up to do like an attribution, meaning sort of like we saw them here, we saw them there, you know, like whatever, because it's like, there's so much of this that is um, subconscious, you know? And again, back to that consistency, being consistent with how your brand shows up, because when you decide you're bored with your brand or you're bored with the way that you're presenting it, what you're doing is resetting your attribution path because now the person's like, wait, is that the same company or is it a different one? Cause I'm not sure. And so that's why you see big companies are very consistent. Like I talk about um, old Navy target and Apple all use the color white. They all use white and almost every single one of their ads start with some kind of white, but you subconsciously know you can like, home, you can predict, Oh, this is going to be an old Navy ad. This is going to be a target ad. It's going to be an Apple ad. And so Smaller companies who have less money need to think about that. And everywhere they're doing a thing, they need to do that thing so that they are pulling people in and really driving that awareness. Yeah. Just because you remember your company, you can never expect that they're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. No, they normally don't. Unless you <laughs> unless you can go to a cocktail party and say, hey, I work for such and such. And everybody goes, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> if they're like, tell me more, like, what do you do? You probably have a branding and awareness issue. So, yeah. Eric Holtzclaw, great discussion, great insight shared. I appreciate it. How does the B2B DM gang get in touch with you? So best place, I'm hanging out a lot on LinkedIn. So if you want to get to me personally, LinkedIn is the way to go. So Eric Holtzclaw, you'll find me on there. Uh, our website is ligerpartners.com, ligerpartners.com. Eric Holtzclaw, Holtzclaw, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom, and we wish you the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.